Well, welcome everyone. My name is Joshua Schick. I'm a curator here at the National World War II Museum, and today um, I'm here with Nancy Rust and Carol Stubbs, author of a children's book about Andrew Jackson Higgins and the glare that won World War II. Sorry about that. Um, I've been really excited uh, to talk about this book, even though the internet conspired against us once and then Mother Nature, but we're finally sitting here and able to talk about something that's always very fascinating to me. In my job as a curator, we interpret history, and history can be interpreted to everyone, not just to adults coming to a museum, but to children, to, to really anyone that wants to listen or you want to send a message to. And so very excited to speak about this book today um, and wish, wish Miss Nancy and Miss Carol a good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good morning, Josh. Um, so I think just right off the bat, uh, why'd you guys want to write a book about Andrew Higgins? <laughs> well, I would say uh, for Andrew Higgins, we thought he was an American hero. I mean, he's kind of an amazing guy, kind of larger than life, almost like the folk heroes like uh, John Henry and Davy Crockett and things like that. And so that was fascinating about him. His life is filled with amazing stories. Some of them even get exaggerated, but they're there. He is, um, his personality is creative, innovative. He's aggressive, he's bold, he's industrious, he's, uh, all those things, and that's always interesting. But then I really like, or we both like, that he used his skills and his talents to help his city, his country, and um, really the world in a great time of need. So he was just an amazing thing to us. And then we had that President Eisenhower said he was the man who won the war, so you have to know more about that. How did that happen? And then for Nancy and I, his Louisiana connection was um, really interesting. We've been writing books together since 2011, and we like to write about Louisiana people and places and events. And Andrew Higgins was so big in New Orleans. My, my family is from there and they remember him. And um, we like writing about ordinary people who do extraordinary things and uh, see what happens with them. And when Andrew Higgins was a boy, he just had a passion for boats. He loved boats. And then look what he did with that. He took it and he um, affected world peace, basically. So he was just an exciting person. And he was an adventure to write about, but then putting it into picture book form was a challenge. And Nancy can tell you more about that. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we actually decided to do a picture book on Andrew Higgins because, um, a nonfiction picture book seems to be the best choice. It's the most accessible and would appeal to reluctant readers. Picture books give a good overview and a lot of information and a small amount of text. And with the visual interest, um, pictures can show things that we don't have to tell. For example, if you will look at the slides from um, of one of the pages, you see how that the Jeep is being loaded onto the boats from the large ship. Men are already uh, on the Higgins boats. And then, so you can see how the boats are loaded without us explaining it with a lot of words. And then there's also a picture um, of the boat of offloading. You see the picture of the tank being uh, loaded onto the beach, coming off the boat onto the beach, the ramp is down. And then you can see in the distance, the soldiers that are coming off carrying things. Um, also, um, we wanted to have uh, a book that would have language and situations that would appeal to children. And so one of the questions that we asked ourselves when we were writing this is, is there an element of surprise in the book? And we thought there was, especially with the way Andrew Higgins first, uh, um, when he was first working with the books, we thought it was an element of surprise when he brought a book out, a boat out through the basement. Um, <laughs> modern day nonfiction books have a lot of additional information so that the books can easily move into the classrooms, even classrooms with much older students. And this 
particular book has a list of important dates. It has a letter to the readers. But I know as adults, even, I mean, I have found that many times I learn a lot from picture books and you can get a lot of information in a short period of time. Yeah, and, I think what you're touching on is always really fascinating that ability to, to interpret in all kinds of different ways. And it's, it's sort of different ways to wow people with new subjects. And it's, it's a beautiful book. One, one other tidbit about a picture book is the, um, that we learned was the whiz, the Jeopardy whiz James Holzhauser. He won a whole lot of money on Jeopardy, the game show, and he prepared for that by reading picture books, nonfiction picture books. So heads up. That's kids. interesting. <laughs> well, this is my start to my game show career then. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, so, Ms. Carroll, you mentioned um, that your family knew Higgins, knew New Orleans, and, and I saw in the book that it was dedicated to the service of, of both of y'all's fathers. Um, so, could you tell me a little bit about them? Did they, did they inspire you? Did they kind of get you interested in this subject? Uh, yes, definitely. So, this is a picture of my dad, and he was, um, his story is amazing. It's almost a book in itself, but he was in Illinois, and he uh, was drafted into the Army in World War II, and he um, went, was eventually taken through training all the way to LSU in the ASTP program, the Specialized Training Program for Engineers, because he'd had engineering, two years of engineering in college. And that's where he went, met my mother, who was from New Orleans. So, um, but he was then sent uh, overseas to work on the pipeline, the Burma, now Myanmar, but the Burma pipeline that went a little parallel to the Burma road all the way to China. So that's what he did. So he didn't actually ride a Higgins boat. I really looked into that to see, but he definitely benefited from soldiers who did because they rode the Higgins boats into Guadalcanal and uh, Okinawa and defeated Japan. And so therefore it, it was, you know, direct relation to him because he was in that Pacific theater. So um, it was, we, we just felt a real tie, and um, Nancy's dad also was on uh, in the Navy, huh? Right, Nancy? I think. Yes, yes, he was. That's, that's a picture of my dad. Uh, he and uh, two of his brothers were in the Navy uh, in World War II. My dad actually joined in 1941 in the spring before um, before Pearl Harbor and he completed OCS and the and was stationed at Norfolk when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Um, my, he was living there with my mom and my older brother. And um, I think he worked in contracts and finances when he was there. And then his next assignment was uh, in San Diego, which is actually where I have my very earliest memory which is of going to the zoo in San Diego and with my dad and my mom and my brother and looking down into a pit of bears. Um, before, after San Diego, he was sent to Australia. And before he went to Australia, he brought um, my mom, my dad, my brother and me back to Kentucky to be close to family and then he was with the Seventh Fleet in Perth, Australia, I believe. I, I'm not too sure what he did, but I do remember that my mom and I would often walk to the post office and to look for letters for him. And there would be many days that there were no letters. And then some days there would be a whole lot of letters that would come at once. And then at least on one occasion, a package came and he had sent, um, uh, koala, some koala bears and kangaroos to my brothers and me that were stuffed animals. And I still have my kangaroo, it's, it's ragged. <laughs> but anyway, I always, I don't know where I got the idea, but I always had the idea that the allies, the United States, Great Britain, Canada, Australia, that they have saved the world. So yeah, I, I feel kind of passionate about it. Well, they're both very fascinating stories. It is, um, you know, it sort of the stories of everyone's service is always very different. And, and it's great that you have keepsakes from it, too. Um, 
Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, so so kind of the next part of sort of prepping for a book like this is, you know, you've got, you've got your intro, inspiration, exposure to the ideas. How, how do you guys research a book like this? You know, what, what did you go to the sources for these sort of things? Well, amazingly, our research started with the World War II Museum because as much as I hate to say this, neither of us actually knew about Andrew Higgins until we went to the World War II Museum. And then we bought Jerry Strahan's book, both of us did. And then we looked at newspaper articles, magazine articles. We talked to experts. We watched documentaries. We contacted Creighton University and the Platte County Historical Society in Nebraska to learn more about his childhood. And then, you know, what it was so important to us that all the time that we were looking through this information, we kept asking ourselves, is, is there a way that we can use this information to help children connect with the story? And does his story have a good message for children? Is he a strong character that we want children to admire? And then can we transform this information into compelling themes for a children's book? And obviously, we, we thought that we could. Carol? Did, uh, yeah, I think that our, our research was definitely that. We have a slide showing one of the stories that we looked at with the ice boat, I think. Um, that, uh, yes, that's one. So there are so many stories about um, Andrew Higgins and it was sorting it out, but we had a great beginning because he loved boats. So that was some way that we could start and connect to and other kids could connect to a, a passion for something like that. And um, this is a story, this picture uh, illustrates a story uh, that I think a lot of people might know from Andrew Higgins, but he wanted a fast boat and he was in Nebraska and they had ice boats that would skim across ice and that's what he wanted to build, a boat that would speed across the ice. And so he built it in the basement of his home. Well, once he and his friends got it built, they couldn't get it out. It was way too big to get out the door. So the story is he took apart the wall and they took the boat out and he did this when Andrew Higgins' mother had gone away, gone to town. And so they had the wall almost put back when she got home. But those were the kinds of things he did as a kid. He looked at something, he saw it as a challenge. He didn't say, oh no, we can't do it, we're doomed. You know, he found a way to do it, even if it might not have been the, the best way, but, <laughs> but he got it done. And then as an adult, he saw the challenges that people who were working in the swamp areas near New Orleans had with boats and trying to get into uh, in and out of areas in the swamp with shallow boats. And we really liked the way he, um, the way he observed life and used that to solve his problems. So when he was trying to find a way to uh, do this, he um, studied the things that were around him, the Cajun pre hero, the flat bottom boats and the Rosiette spoonbills in the swamps. And he looked at their bill and used that to help the boat go up on the shore. And then he also studied though the boats in Holland, tunnel boats and the blue whale and things like that. And he used all that to come up with a boat that would work better in the swamps. And his goal was to design a boat. And I'll read this because his quote, crunch through driftwood, bounce over logs, climb a beach and wham up on a sloping concrete seawall. And who wouldn't want that? <laughs> it just sounds so great. And he did design that, he did just that. And it was the Eureka boat and that was the predecessor to the Higgins boat. So he's just, there's so many things and stories about him. It was hard to pull it into one, uh, one place. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's, that's one of those things. And you know, kids, you can take this message along. You can never research too much about something because it's always great to just have all of that there and, and the quality shows through with, with how it comes through. I, 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 for reviewing a children's book, I'm like, this is really great. <laughs> and just the problem what, with, with writing about Higgins was not what to, I mean, was not finding enough to write about, but it was just to use not too much information. And so we really had to limit ourselves to 
just a story about his boat. Yeah. It was, mm -hmm. it was, yeah, figuring, sorting through all of it, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, you can't really get his uh, labor disputes into a good illustrated, <laughs> you know, volume. Well, there was a lot we could eliminate. Right? Oh, yeah, he, I mean, he built, um, he built businesses as a child, like mowing lawns and yeah. having other people work for him and everything, but we, we decided we couldn't tell that in the amount of time that we had, so. Well, I think that I, I think that's really interesting because I, I kind of want to switch to talking about the book itself next because sort of as you pick up I you know I happen to know a lot of the history and I can see that it's communicated through what you did but you just don't have the ability to say oh he built the lawn mowing business truck driving you know like mm -hmm. listing all that and you really kind of get those messages um, so I think I want to start with something we talked about a little bit earlier and we've definitely seen the illustrations it's a beautiful book you know, it's really, the illustrations are wonderful. And so, you know, I think we touched on it a little bit earlier. The design of the photograph, the paintings and everything are really nice. So that was really neat part of that research. Um, and using those to kind of interpret some of the subjects that Higgins talked about, there were two, at least for me, and please feel free to expand the other ones that really stuck out of interest to talk about, first of all, him dropping out of school. You know, how do you deal with a subject like that in a book like this? And then, um, you know, is that sort of compared to education today? You know, is it different in the time period for kids? Uh, it, it is important, I think, for children today to understand that formal education was very different in those days. If you will look at this graph, you will, or chart, you'll see that in 1900, uh, 6.8% of people graduated from high school. By the time World War II came, half of the people were graduating from high school. And so even though uh, Higgins did drop out, uh, he continued to learn. His, he, the way a lot of people learned in those days was um, on the job training. And when he joined the National Guard, he had his first experience with amphibious landings in crossing the Platte River. And also he worked on um, with logging. He had multiple jobs in logging. He worked in uh, for a bank with um, uh, in the foreign exchange department. He worked as a timber loader, an estimator, a buyer. So really the message for children from this is like what you learn today may help you in some surprising ways in the future. And he did do some other additional learning. He, um, he said that he read dozens of books on military history. And he took a three month course in farming from Auburn University. And he also did a correspondence course in naval architecture. But I think probably the most important thing for kids to remember is, is that you know, he continued to learn his entire life, even though he didn't uh, finish high school. Yeah, I think a uh, correspondence course is interesting in the context of today, too, because so many kids are on Zoom right now, you know, True. owning it in, essentially, and sort of, I just realized it's a funny connection toward, towards that. I was yeah. saying, how do we explain a correspondence course to kids? Well, it's, it's probably what you're doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, another question about a, another sort of subject within the book, and, and Ms. Carroll, if you have something to add about school, please, you know, jump back in on it. But our, our, our next question, too, is um, you communicate, you know, fair compensation employment across racial and gender boundaries um, by Higgins, something that he did. You know, he just, he was seeking out quality workers that could do the job. And how important was it to you to include this? Um, we, we felt that this was really, really important. And one, it gives an insight into his character, um, we thought, and it shows how he got things done. And he um, was focused on what the job was and getting that done. He was building boats. He was building boats for the war effort. He was building a particular kind of boat and he wanted to get it done. He was very charismatic as we've talked about. He was also an extremely hard worker himself. So he was a good example to people. And he always inspired people to do their best. Um, 
But in that, he stood up for what was right. And I think part of that was just he wanted to get the job done. So he wasn't going to worry about what might get in the way of that. So he hired everyone who was willing to work, no gender, age, physical, or racial bias. He just hired people. And um, then he gave them equal pay and he gave them even extra benefits. And I think he was really involved in the war effort in New Orleans in all kinds of ways in, in that. And in that, his factories topped all kinds of uh, rates, production rates nationwide. And he, I think he started with like 75 employees, Josh, you can probably correct all this, but and went on to over 20,000, you know, with eight factories all over the city. And he just kind of took over New Orleans. You could see his um, boats in Lake Pontchartrain and, you know, he trained people to use the boats. He built the boats, he built them in a factory and dropped them down the second. He was just so creative, you know, he didn't let obstacles stand in his way. He figured out how to get over it, whether it was hiring the right people or finding space for his factory. It was, he just got it done. <laughs> it was amazing. So a lot of lessons for us in this, you know, when we, we feel like something's in our way. So. Yeah, it, it, it really is fascinating because it, it, his work, like I said, it became so large and it, there's hardly a family in the city of New Orleans and surrounding areas that he did not touch over a course of that four-year period, but then it's interesting and I think it's one of the great reasons why you guys have written this book, especially for children in the next sets of generations, is you, know, you yourself said it hadn't really even heard of the man until you went to the World War II Museum and saw it. So it's interesting how his legacy was so massive and impactful, faded away completely, but now there's an effort, and this is among one of the works, to kind of get that back out there. Well, that, and I, I talked to my aunt who lived at that time, uh, my mother's sister, and she she remembers Andrew Higgins, you know, she, she definitely remembers. So like you said, during that little period of time, he was very big in New Orleans. <clears throat> and then so sad, he just kind of dropped away for a while. But. Well, and of course the boats, every time you see a movie or anything with the landing, you see the boats. I had seen the Higgins boat, but I just did not know the story of the man behind them. And actually, I am embarrassed to say, I didn't even know they were called Higgins boats. You know, they were just landing boats to me. Yeah, that's a uh, pretty quality branding on his part, whether <laughs> by hook or crook, however he got it done. You know, it's, you know, it's like, because the, the proper military designation is landing craft vehicle personnel, but it doesn't quite just roll off the tongue like that and would take up a lot of cover space on a book. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, you've got kind of one more question before we sort of open it up to, to anyone that's shooting in questions. So please, by, by all means, anyone that's watching, you know, hit the uh, Q&A or the chat button and, and fire some in our direction. Um, and we've, we've covered a lot of this question, but we'll just give you one more chance to can sum it up. Why is this book important for children to read? You know, we've got a lot of literature on the Second World War and amphibious invasions and boat sign and all that stuff. Why, why do you think your book is important for children? Um, well, we've got lots of reasons we think it is, but we think it's important for them to read about real people. And we think it helps them understand the continuum, continuum of life and how we're all interconnected in that. And then to see real people and their success and their failures and how they met challenges and how they lived before the internet and before mass communication. And we also hope it inspires them to use their imagination and to never stop learning about new things. Andrew Higgins never stopped learning. And then for parents and teachers, I think there's a lesson in the story of Andrew Higgins inspires us to encourage creativity in our children and to give them space to learn and read and create. I mean, what if Andrew Higgins' mother had said, no way are you building a boat in the basement? You know, that she easily could have said that, but she allowed him, of course, I think she had 10 kids, so <laughs> maybe if he was the last one. Maybe he just had more freedom, but um, also another key factor is Andrew Higgins um, is important because he lived in a time of global crisis, and we are living in a time of global crisis right now with the pandemic. And so we're writing history as we speak. And children can learn this from the story of Andrew Higgins, how they can face the challenges and changes that are inevitable in life. Exactly. Children need to know that 
I think that uh, life is full of challenges and uncertainties and fears, and that there was once before this a horrible situation that arose, and everybody came out on the other side okay. And I think that if by studying Andrew Higgins' life, I think his life compels children to think uh, right from the beginning. He is a kid who loses his dad. And how did that change his life? You know, when somebody reads about this, they have to think about it, a tragedy in some, some child's life. And how did it change his life? Did he want to move? Um, did he, how did he know that there was a sailboat under the water for the first boat that he built? Um, how did he get it to shore? Did he get in trouble? Um, I think that this book gives kids a um, new way of looking at, at new ideas, new ways to think. It helps them to develop critical thinking skills. It helps them to understand about their ancestors. And I think just as importantly as answering questions, it creates questions. And so I think that the book inspires children to dream and it gives them some tools for making the dreams come true. I uh, couldn't agree with you more. Answering questions and creating them as well that kind of drive for curiosity. It's very, very Higgins. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, we, um, we've got some questions coming in. Uh, and I think, let's see, we're going to start with this one. It's, it's an excellent question um, about the process of writing the book. Could you talk about writing the book together? Um, and do you see the need for more children's books geared towards the Second World War? Um, I, I, I do see a need. I see a need for more, uh, and I think there is a response to that of um, more books, nonfiction biography books, and that would include World War II also. And I think that um, that genre is kind of growing. Um, as far as us writing together, <laughs> it's, uh, we've been doing this since 2011, like I said, and it's, um, it's wonderful. We, we, um, have both said that we don't think we would do it unless we had both of us. We kind of encourage each other and uh, hold each other responsible. And so those are, those are great things. And then uh, we can share the research and things like that. So I don't know, Nancy, you want to add to that? Con contradict me on that. <laughs> you can tell the bad part of writing together. <laughs> I don't know. There, I mean, I guess that there's some downsides to everything, but I would say that there, for us at least, it has been more of a positive than a negative. Yeah. And even when, I mean, sometimes we don't agree. We, we <laughs> might not agree over what should be said or how it should be said. And, you know, it, it makes us stop and think a whole lot. And mm -hmm. so we just keep working at it until we are both in agreement. And I think it, it, it has helped me at least um, become probably a better thinker about what I write, you know, because I know Carol's going to be there saying, tell <laughs> me if, if there's something that uh, I need to improve on. Well, have you considered building the boat together? <laughs> That's next. <laughs> <laughs> That's next, yeah. Who's basement? Um, all right, well, we've got... Uh, I think another sort of a mechanical question about you know making a book. Um, the question is, what's the readability of the book? You know, I, I might add on top of that to say, you know, how do you gear these books towards certain audiences? You know, is it geared towards specifically a fifth grader or you know? Our editor actually uh, has some guidelines that we had to follow as far as the readability level goes, but um, our experience has been that picture books are very helpful for kids of all ages, like, like Carol said earlier, um, even adults. And, you know, I don't think that you ever have a book, I mean, I've never heard anyone complain about, oh, this book was too easy for me to read. It's not that probably how hard it is to read, but the information that is in it. 
-hmm. And you know, if you, if you give the same book to kids of different ages, they see different things about it and can go into more depth of thinking depending on what their own experiences and ages are. Yeah, I think it appeals to different levels. Uh, you know, it, it can appeal to a, a young child. They're, they're going to get things at each level they go to. But I would say like um, my uh, grand, when my grandson was seven, he loved uh, biographies like this. And, you know, so it just depends. Mm -hmm. and um, and when they, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I just, I wanted to, that second part of that question, the person complimented the illustrations. I wanted to make sure that got in there, too. <laughs> well, what I'm was glad the second? that they did, because the illustrations in a, in a nonfiction book have to be accurate, and Brock was just, um, he just managed to get everything out exactly um, in an accurate way, I think. If you will notice in the, at the beginning, he had a picture of a 1906 delivery truck and then later you have the trucks that are from the 20s and the 30s and we did send him pictures of um of a lot of things that helped with it but the thing that i think that brock did that is just so amazing is is that he took a subject that was that is a you know, it's full of, it could be a gloomy looking book, but his, the way that he did it, it just exudes optimism and you see people working and solving problems and the book is, is really a cheerful looking book, even though the subject is, is a parallel subject. Yeah, yeah, we're the getting illustration. a lot of compliments on the illustrations. Sorry, Miss Carol, go ahead. No, no, that, I was going to say they're so important in a picture book. It really is 50-50. It, it just makes a huge difference. And, and that our illustrator was Brock Nicole. I don't know if we said his name, but he, he's from Canada, and he was amazing. Yeah, I do find that interesting. You provided him with images. You know, how many were, you just gave him a couple and that served as inspiration, and then he's able to interpret it. Right. Yeah. Was that, we had, a, was that a fun process going back and forth? <laughs> well, we didn't actually, our, our publisher, Pelican Publishing, uh, they, they were the intermediary. So we would give things to our editor. They may ask us about it periodically. So we didn't work directly with him. We have since the book's been published, but, um, but he, yeah, he was, he's amazing with the, the beauty of his pictures and we have, we get comments on it all the time. It's really an incredible. And we did some pictures of things that he probably would not, I think he, he did most of the research on World War II um, himself, mm -hmm. but things like the boats uh, bringing logs out of the swamps, we did send some pictures of that. That was, that's still even with the pictures hard for me to imagine it, so. Yeah, good old shallow Louisiana waterways. <laughs> um, so, got you know, two more questions, and I think that'll be a, a kind of a good wrap up to this. Um, and they're geared a little bit more towards, uh, you know, what was your favorite story that you learned over the course of this, or that you included in it? Uh, Nancy, you want or? I, I told you know too that that I that I really like the I like the ice boat story and uh, that he was out and I I love the way he looked at things. Uh, it really makes me think about how you look at things that are around you and beyond you to solve problems and the way he did the the Piro and the tunnel boat and uh, I I just love those you know I love his problem solving type character. I, I did too. I liked it and I liked the stories from his childhood and I think I really love the story that he hired people and paid them equally no matter um, what their gender or race was that it was equal pay for equal work and for him to do this at a time when many businesses didn't seemed to speak to me uh, pretty strongly that he was a man of great character. Um, 
the last question is is a little bit i'm gonna i'll pull and throw in my two little cents real quick and then gonna kind of turn it to you guys it's a uh, the question is, I know Higgins built some PT boats. You know, how many other boats did he design? And, and Higgins, like you guys have said, it, he designed more than you could put into a children's book here, or really almost any book. You know, he, he made a helicopter at one point. He made parts for aircraft. He built engines, refurbished Jeeps, trucks, landing craft, dozens of different types and styles, PT boats, uh, parts for the Manhattan Project. It's a huge amount of things that Higgins put his mind to um, and I noticed in the book, you guys did put a scene of PT boats on a production line, you know, just maybe kind of comment on what you thought about adding different things or even why you kind of, the PT boats ended up in there. Well, I do think that the PT boats, I mean, everybody probably has heard about PT 109 and President Kennedy. And we did think that it was important to include it, but we didn't, you know, we did not give anything the emphasis that we gave with just the building the boats and the landing boats. That because we, with the picture book, you have to keep everything in such tight focus. Mm -hmm. But he, he was amazing in the, the, like you said, all the things that he built. And I remember one story that we didn't even include in there that you probably know, Joshua, when he, I, and I guess it was the Marines asked him for a boat or a plan within three days. And he said, I'll do better than that. I'll build the boat in three days. And he did, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's stories like that all around that he was just, and um, he was he's just amazing, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a wonderful book and, and I think it's a wonderful subject. So uh, there's a few more questions about you know, sort of what's available at the museum and everything. And we, we do have a permanent exhibit in Louisiana Memorial Pavilion dedicated to Andrew Jackson Higgins and his boats. Um, we also have uh, two landing craft that are on display, both restored by museum volunteers and, and really a lot of online content. Um, this book in our bookstore right now. So, you know, we're, we're really trying to be the beacon for what Higgins was to the war effort and what he was in New Orleans. And uh, one of the excellent ways is by this book that um, Miss Nancy Rust and Miss Carol Stubbs have written. So I want to thank everyone for coming and I want to thank you Miss Nancy and Miss Carol for being here and talking to us about your book and y'all just remember that this will be posted online later at the National World War II Museum's website where we can watch it anytime. So um, thank y'all for coming today. I really appreciate it. Thank you Josh for thank having you. us. Yeah thank uh -huh. you so much. All right well y'all have a great day and um, come back and see us. <laughs>